Hi everyone, and welcome to the Digital Politics International Academy. It's our pleasure to start the 2023 edition of Digital Politics webinar series, which will help to make the knowledge of digital dentistry really available for everyone through a series of webinars that will be hosted and organized by the Digital Politics International Academy. It's our pleasure and honor to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Song Yang Ma from the University of Otago, New Zealand. During this webinar, Dr. Ma will explore the latest techniques and technologies used in digital dentistry to create removable prosthesis. From digital impressions to CAD CAM technology, you will learn how these tools can help you achieve optimal results for your patients. Dr. Ma is an associate professor, specialist postdoctoral test, and associate dean for the postgraduate studies at the Department of Oral Rehabilitation, Faculty of Dentistry, University of Otago. Her research interests include this conducting clinical trials using different treatment modalities, involving dental implants for patients, especially in the older age group that need to replace their missing teeth. The main research outcome of interest includes biological success of the treatment as well as long-term clinical maintenance complication issues for both clinicians and patients, including any treatment impact and oral health related quality of life for these patients. Dr. Ma is also the primary investigator evaluating the clinical stability of zirconia apartments in association with low temperature degradation and wear at the titanium zirconia implant apartment interfaces. With ongoing national and international collaborations, in addition to previous successful research grants and continuous external research funding support, Dr. Ma continues to produce research outputs in the areas of oral implantology and gerodontology. Dr. Ma has multiple international invitations to present her research in the, uh, this area and is currently working on several book chapters, specifically in the area of implant overdentures. She has supervised multiple undergraduate and postgraduate research projects and is actively involved as a reviewer for multiple international peer review journals and grant applications. Dr. Ma was also the recipient of multiple national and international awards. So um, just one more thing um, that I would like to mention that although all the live and recorded webinars are uh, freely available for everyone, uh, certification fee of uh, will be applied for those who are willing to have a certificate. Um, this fee is mainly used to maintain the webinar operation costs, such as uh, third party registrations and services. A certification of continuing professional development, CPD, in digital politics will be issued to the registrants attending who attend the at least 75% of the webinar's time and are willing to have the CBT certificate. So uh, without any delay, let us uh, welcome Dr. Ma. Uh, Dr. Ma, I think uh, the stage is yours, so let me stop uh, sharing my, my screen. Please. Thank you, Dr. Albashti, and thank you for the um, opportunity to present today on the digital dentistry and removable prosthodontics. Um, I had I started on this project and to see have, have a look and see what kind of information is currently available in terms of the digital dentistry that's being used in RAMPROS. Um, I realize it is it's a huge area that we can cover, and today. I'm going to mainly focus on uh, removable partial prosthodontics so that we can give you some idea on what kind of um, intraoral scanning is available as well as the CAD-CAM technology. 
So to start off with, obviously, we are all very familiar with the conventional workflow. That's what we've been taught at the dental school, and that's what we've been doing so far in our practices. We start mixing our alginate impressions material, make the most beautiful primary impressions, which is going to be your baseline for um, doing your surveying, designing, and coming up with a framework that's going to be suitable for your um, patient. You make a secondary impressions using silicon materials, and that will take some um, techniques, I'm sure, to get the um, most accurate impression possible, which will make the journey of the dental technician as easy and smooth um, for them. It will require a dental technician who is going to be um, technically sufficient and uh, understand the design of the material as well as a um, the properties to be able to manipulate this so that the framework that you're getting is going to be biologically and technically sound. But of course, this is what we've been doing and there are other things out there in terms of the technology that's been um, improving um, every day in terms of the accuracy as well as the usability. So what else is out there in terms of what we can provide for our patients? I think the first step of digital um, dentistry in terms of removable pros is you start off with how you're going to plan and design your um, partially dentate patients. I think the first step, it starts with the intraoral scanning. And I think a lot of you probably have already started using intraoral scanners in your practice, whether it's going to be for your fixed pros, removable pros, or implant dental work. I think the advantages are obvious to us as well as to our patients that you don't need to use any type of materials that might be um, causing discomfort to our patients. You have to manipulate it and make sure that you're going to use this material in a timely manner. You need to make custom trays um, for certain cases and that will um, increase the cost as well as the time in between the visits. The beauty of using the intraoral scanner is that if you are working in a rural area where you don't have um, very close contact with your dental technician, is that you can communicate with them via cloud or on, on things of platform like this on Zoom, where you can communicate with the same type of um, information that is available and you can communicate them with them in, in a timely manner. So there's not going to be a lot of delay in between where you have to deliver your impressions or having to um, wait until the impression material is being pulled. Of course, it doesn't mean that it's only come with advantages. There's also are some limitations that you need to overcome. Intraoral scanning, it takes some time for the clinician to be able to um, overcome the learning curve at the beginning, but I see a lot of my students who are in the younger generation, they pick up new skills very, very quickly, and it, it is not a huge deal for them. But and I also see a lot of my colleagues embracing the new technology to be able to use this um, beautiful technology at the end. Some of the areas of the teeth may be quite difficult to detect and also um, to do with how you're going to prepare the area. I think the biggest limitation for the clinician to uptake this technology is that there's initial financial cost of obtaining the equipment. But once that's been um, overcome, I think you'll definitely enjoy um, some of the benefits that will come with the intraoral scanners. So I think the next question is how accurate are these intraoral scanners, especially in terms of with when you are going to provide your patients with partial dental workflow. I think there's a lot of studies already available that shows you um, great success in terms of when you're providing single crowns, short span bridges using intraoral scanner. How about the focus on the partial dental workflow at the end? So when you are looking at um, assessing the accuracy, you need to divide this into two areas. One is the trueness and the second part is the precision. So trueness means how close your data is in terms of the actual or the true value of the item that you are currently scanning. 
So it has to be as closely linked or closely matched up to, um, to the reference point. Precision means how much reproducibility you are gaining from this um, data collection. So you can see that if you have a low trueness where the data you are gathering is very um, not representative of the reference point, but if it's reproducing all the time the same error, this does not mean that you are getting a high accuracy. What you really want is high trueness and the high precision where every time you're using your intro scanner, it's going to create as close um, representation of your reference point, but it's going to reproduce this all the time so you don't have this doubt whether when you are taking the intro scanning today or tomorrow, whether there's going to be any discrepancy at the end. Obviously, there are a lot of factors that's involved in terms of how accurate your intro scanning is going to be. And it can be divided between the operator factors and the patient factors. A lot of the operator factors, um, I think you can control uh, you really need to have a look and investigate the type of the intro scanner that you're using. You'll see a variety of different equipment that is now available these days. If you went to the IDS um, conference this year, you'll see a number of different scans that you've never even seen before. And every company is now really jumping into this game. They come with different head size, whether it's gonna be very small to give you the usability um, advantage. Some will say if you're using a very big head size, it's going to scan much quicker and it's going to um, cover the area in a more um, reliable way. You need to make sure that you're going to calibrate your um, intraoral scanner often so that you are getting that reproducibility and the high trueness for your patient's data. Scanning distance, um, as well as the scanning pattern and how often you need to repeat your scan will also um, rely on your experience level. So you'll see that as you're picking up the um, equipment for the first time, it will take you some time to be able to scan in a very smooth manner. And you'll also learn to manipulate your um, intraoral scanner in a more predictable way so that you're not getting a little skips or um, cutting off of your data to get the most reliable um, SCL file for your patient. Some of the ambient environments or so temperature changes of the room that you are um, storing your intraoral scanner, the humidity level of the, um, the room as well, you need to control those. The lighting conditions, I think you'll be able to see whether just the um, intraoral scanner is sufficient or whether you need the additional lighting within the, um, the operating um, place. Patient factors also is very important and that really depends on the types of the patient that you are treating. Um, literature does say that the two type itself is um, affecting the accuracy of the intraoral scan where when you compare between the anterior versus the posterior, the posterior two type tends to have a slightly more um, discrepancy in, um, in comparison to the anterior two. Interdental space, um, I think that's very, very important when you are treating partially dentate patients, whether you have a very narrow and a small area of interdental space, maybe you have a diastema or maybe a single missing tooth space that has been collapsed. If you don't have the flexibility of um, using the intro scanner to capture the interproximal area, you'll notice that the scan that you're getting is not as accurate as compared to when you are doing a conventional method. Arch width is also very important. The wider the arch, more difficult it's going to be or more predictable it's going to be for your scan to be accurate, including a palette. Uh, will also um, cause a little bit of issue as well because some intraoral scanner is not as good at picking up the soft tissue details um, depending on the hard and the software um, specs. 
It dangerous area um, obviously is a problem in comparison to a dente area. Dente area has a lot of anatomical structure that you can use for the intraoral scanner to pick up the details and link them back up. A dentulous area has a very limited um, anatomical landmarks. It could be very, very smooth with no um, irregularities and registering mobile tissue can also be very difficult. And these are some of the areas that's going to be extremely important in order to provide your patient with a successful um, retentive and supporting um, processes at the end. So when you compare between different types of, of partially dentate region, um, I think this study shows you uh, some um, good examples of what kind of deviations you, you might be get, getting from intraoral scanning. Unfortunately, um, they found that partially, although partially dentulous condition does affect the trueness of enteral scanning, it didn't really tell you as to what is causing the problem. Is it the length of the edential span or is it the position of the edential scan? They found a class four, such as um, figure eight, where you are now only missing the anterior um, maxillary teeth, they had the highest trueness. In comparison to this, um, class two with the class three modification one had the lowest trueness. So it gives you some idea as to, yes, it definitely affects the um, intraoral scan because of the edentulous area that you are trying to capture. But if you compare this scenario to say, a figure D where you only had an additional edentulous area, it actually didn't have a correlation in terms of whether additional edentulous area on top of the current one would actually cause, say, a double or um, triple um, discrepancy in the linear deviation. So it is still a little bit um, uncertain as to what is the actual cause of the trueness deviation when you are scanning it partially, it then partially then tape mouth. Another factor that you really need to consider is how you're going to scan your partially then tape patient. Um, I think a lot of the companies nowadays um, provide you with a quick scanning strategy to show you where you should start from and in what direction you should be moving your intraoral scanner. So not all scanner will give you the same direction because they have done some studies themselves to make sure that the trueness at the end is going to be accurate. So for example, if you are using say TRIOS 4, they will ask you to start on the occlusal surface first, go into the palatal or the lingual area to pick up the details of the teeth as well as the soft tissue, and then come back out to the buccal surface to create the final scan. If you're using a different scanner, for example, a prime scan will give you a slightly different um, starting point. They'll ask you to start from the palatal first to pick up the lingual and the soft tissue area, come back up to the occlusal, and then finish off with the buccal surface. So be very, very careful and um, do your background research to make sure that you're following the manufacturer's guideline. In terms of the scanning strategy, longer the scan pass, so if you are doing a sectional scan in terms of maybe you are doing a single crown, um, rather than a three unit bridge or partial denture, a lot shorter scan is definitely going to give you more accurate data. But obviously in terms of partially dentate mouth where you're trying to provide your patient with a removable prosthesis, you will need to pick up all the details that is required to give you the support and the retention um, and the stability. So that has some indication or um, indication that's the scan that you are creating at the end may not be as accurate as what you would like to um, achieve. There is some distance deviation that increases as the scan path increases. So <clears throat> in terms of the linear um, discrepancy, there will be some this discrepancy if you are comparing it back to the conventional silicon impression. 
Fortunately, the angular and the tooth axis deviation didn't really increase um, just because of the amount of the scanning that occurs at the end. So here's a typical example of what you might be um, seeing in a partially dentate patient where you have several missing um, edentulous area and also a lone standing abutment tooth. Study has shown that if you are trying to scan a lone standing abutment tooth, that is not as accurate as if you are scanning abutment teeth have the neighboring teeth. Partly because there is the empty area here where there's no anatomical structure or very defined anatomical structure for the intraoral scanner to pick up the details to be able to link them back up together. And they have found that there's a small discrepancy in terms of the mesial deviation of the abutment tooth. So it's almost as if the tooth is pulling slightly forward to be able to have their linkage back up again to the soft tissue and into the remaining um, dentition. So I think the challenge today um, remains um, in terms of if you are trying to incorporate intraoral scanner into your digital workflow to be able to provide your patient with the removal partial denture. There's a lot of work going on at the moment for the complete dentures where they use um, different types of little anatomical or geographical um, pieces to be able to close the um, linkage back up between where you are scanning the edentulous mouth as well as um, some of the soft tissue that is moving. The most difficult area I think for the partially dentate mouth is the candy class one and candy class two, where you're trying to um, overcome the difference between the support that you're getting from the soft tissue and the edentulous area, as well as the retention and the support that you're getting from the dentate area. The next step um, in the digital workflow with the partial denture, I think the most exciting part probably is the virtual surveying and the designing. Um, I remember when I was a student and you're trying to learn how to um, use this nay surveyor, trying to figure out what is my path of insertion and the tripodization that is the most accurate. I think this computer software definitely overcomes this. And a lot of the students have found this very useful. They automatically determine the path of insertion. The software will measure the depth of undercuts to be able to create the parallelism and rotate the um, cast in 3D to get the best tilt. So what you would have done on an AO surveyor, you're now doing it on a more virtual computer software. It will create um, the undercut, uh, well, it will mark the undercut as well as block out any of the soft tissue undercut at the same time. You can see the um, amount of the undercut that is being blocked out or being indicated in terms of the color mapping. So it gives you the visual um, workflow and to give you the ideal setting in terms of how the partial denture is going to be um, designed. I think that probably the most difficult part of this is the actual designing part. You have to understand some of the um, components that is available on the software to be able to manipulate this. If you are aware of how to do your wax pattern in a manual um, way, I think it will definitely help you. But some of the uh, wax pattern, patterning that you would normally do in a conventional manner, it may not be so possible in terms of the virtual designing at the end. It also depends on the type of the material that you're using and to be able to overcome some of the limitations of the materials that you'll be milling um, in order to fabricate the framework. So once that has been designed, you'll get an STL file of the partial dental framework that you're going to fabricate. And at this point, you can decide whether you're going to um, continue on with the digital workflow or include a little bit of hybrid workflow in between um, for your patient. So this can be printed using um, 3D printer. A lot of um, clinicians and dental technicians for sure um, have embraced the benchtop 3D printer these days. It's a lot easier to use. There's 
variety of materials that is available to support the dentistry. These can be printed in a very simple way. Um, and there's a lot of data in terms of how you can make sure that the angulation of the printing is done correctly in order to give you that um, additional um, accuracy for your casting. So conventional um, cobalt chromium framework could then be fabricated. And I think I'll, I think all of us on the audience will be familiar with the cobalt chromium framework. It has definitely served us very well in terms of the strength as well as the retention that it provides to our patient. Um, it is very light in terms of the weight um, and it can be very, very thin and well adapted to the mucosa if you're comparing this back to its counterpart, which will be the acrylic partial denture. The extra um, benefit of using the 3D printed um, framework is that you can have the resin printed and you could even do a little checking point in between. So you don't have to go straight into the fabrication or the manufacturing process, but you could do a little checkpoint in the middle um, to be able to see if there's any modification that could be done before the casting happens um, at the technical lab. So you might be able to do a little bit of adjustment on the rest area or some of the um, minor connected area that might be impinging onto the occlusal surfaces. If there's any area that might be um, lacking in terms of adaptation, you could add those um, before the casting happens. So the next step becomes a lot smoother and a lot more um, chair time efficient in terms of um, fitting the framework and trying them in to make sure that they fit very closely to the abutment teeth. So conventional co um, cobalt chromium framework, um, they work very well. Obviously there's some limitation in terms of the fabricating part. There is a small shrinkage of the metal during casting. Um, I found a paper which is getting a little bit um, older, but it gives you some idea as to how many different types of errors could happen if you do go through the conventional workflow. I was actually very amazed at the number of different errors that um, these authors um, managed to pick up. Um, I, I wonder how we ever managed to do any cobalt chromium framework considering all these errors that can happen. I, I think knowing these, I'll be very, very cautious about doing every step. Um, it starts obviously with the making and the pouring of the impressions. You have to be as accurate as possible. You follow the manufacturer instruction. The pouring time has been respected. A lot of the technical work, um, if the technician understands the um, errors could happen in between by not following the instructions, obviously that a lot of the um, errors could happen in here as well. And obviously the processing of the acrylic could be very technique sensitive at the end. So by the time you go through all these, there are 243 different errors that could happen while you're doing a partial denture. I don't think I've ever told my patient that this could happen. Um, I wonder if anyone will actually go through if I did tell them that there are that many errors that can happen during the workflow. <laughs> 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 uh, so with the cobalt chromium framework, obviously you don't have to do the conventional way either. Um, there's the different ways of manufacturing this. You can use a SLM method, which is a selective laser melting uh, way where they have the powdered um, mutual alloy that is now being fused by layer. It's like a 3D printing of your cobalt chromium framework. This is the type that you'll get once it's been um, cut away from the support area and been polished and um, well um, finished at the end and comparing it back to the or traditional cobalt chromium framework, you'll notice that there aren't that much difference. Obviously this will only happen if you do have a technical colleagues who do have this kind of technology. This will be a lot of financial investment for the dental technician. And I think if you do have the um, opportunity to use this type of material or type of the workflow, um, 
have a try. I have tried with my patients and the finish that come back is just wonderful. But do they actually fit very well in terms of when you're comparing it back to a master technician who are putting all their effort into doing the wax pattern as well as the finishing of the framework? Um, studies have shown that the, there is definitely an acceptable level of the fit in terms of how the occlusal or rest fits onto the resty area on the abutment. The SLM framework and the traditional framework, you'll see that there's hardly any difference um, in terms of how much spacing that is allowed or how, I mean, how much spacing that has been created by the fabrication. The amount of the time that you'll be spending to do that minor adjustment chair side as you are um, fitting the framework, there's also that not much difference between the SLM and the traditionally fabricated frameworks. So why, why not embrace the technology that is available if it is available where you are working at the moment? Obviously, there are also other different types of materials that can be used for fabricating RPD frameworks. And that's um, thanks to the CAD CAM technology. We have the titanium that can be 3D printed, zirconia frameworks that can also be made for your partial denture. But I think what you are probably familiar with is the polyether ketone ketone um, framework that is now readily available in the market. It is definitely lighter than the cobalt chromia. If you ever um, had any experience of using these frameworks, when you first get them, you're actually quite shocked by how light and fine this material is. Um, you're almost a little bit um, worried that this will break in terms of when, if you are very um, familiar with using cobalt chromia work. This also gives the benefit to our patient that if they have any allergies to metal, um, definitely using PEC material is going to be advantageous. Um, if the patient is very aesthetically demanding and they have very high smile line where you can definitely see the metal um, component on the anterior section, maybe blending the um, white or the polymer material onto the clasping unit might be more beneficial for our patients at the end. So the polymer material is um, commonly known as PEC, uh, and these are divided into PEAK and PEC. Um, I think most people will be very, very familiar with the PEAK material. This has been um, available readily in the implant dentistry area, and they're also um, becoming quite common in the removable prosthodontic uh, market as well. They're monomer free, um, so if they are allergic to metal, obviously it's going to be beneficial, but if they're also allergic to PMMA, um, it's going to be another bonus for our patient um, as well. So another opportunity to be able to provide partial denture without having to be constricted to using just one type of material. So pig material is biocompatible, which is very useful in dentistry. Um, it has good mechanical properties, but if you do compare to cobalt chromium framework, obviously it's not going to be as superior. Um, one benefit is that it has the high temperature resistance and the chemical stability. So if you do use this material, um, it has shown that it has definitely less discoloration issue compared to PMMA. You could even sterilize this because of the high temperature resistance. So now you're providing almost um, the cleanest prosthesis before you um, deliver. It has a poor thermal conductivity. So patients who are very sensitive to um, heat will have that benefit um, of wearing this type of material compared to another type. Um, it also has a um, more flexibility around the clasping unit. So it could also engage a lot deeper undercut if it is available on the abutment. And at the end, because of the elasticity um, that it comes with, it's not going to put a lot of stress or the um, pressure around the area, especially if you have um, compromise abutment to that you're trying to nurse along um, as you go through the treatment. So here's a typical example of what can be done if you are using pig material for your framework, where you have done all the design according to the um, 
the CAD software that is available. You have the framework that's been designed. Um, you may have taken an intro scan of the partially dent tape mouth, or may, you may have done the um, extra oral scan of the cast that's been provided. You've done all the um, designing of where the dental teeth are going to be so that there's a combination of um, the framework as well as the prosthetic um, dental teeth on the software. The pig material then is um, milled out out of a puck. Um, so it's a one piece that's been designed and milled. Um, it's now been abraded with the aluminum oxide to get the roughening of the surfaces where you want to do the some bonding and attachment of the um, additional structure. These are also milled out or printed according to the design that you have because you could split the tooth design as well as the flange area on the care software and then bond it onto like a jigsaw puzzle. So now you're just fitting back them, back them onto the framework as well as the tooth on the, um, the flange area. So you can see how smooth this will be in terms of the um, fabrication or the manufacturing process of your partial denture and it's going to be I'm sure it'll be a lot more easier with time with and as well as the improvement with the software as well as the manufacturing process. One key thing that you may notice with the um, milled framework is that if you are using a pig material, you need to understand that there is definitely going to be some design difference between the cobalt chromium framework and the pig material, simply because of the mechanical properties that the first. So as I explained to you previously, that the pig material has a lot lower um, elasticity Young's modulus elasticity. So what you need to do is that you need to make this a lot thicker compared to the cobalt chromium framework um, casting. You'll notice that also the way you design is slightly different from what the way you've been taught traditionally. So we've been taught in a partial denture um, module that only the tip of the retentive arm, so that's the one third of the terminus, will engage underneath the survey line. And because that's the only area that should really engage and flex as the patient is inserting or withdrawing the partial denture. But because of the difference in the mechanical property of the polymer, the design can now be changed and you almost need to slightly throw away what you've been taught in the traditional uh, methods and it'll probably feel very um, strange to have uh, such a thick um, clasping unit that touches both above as well as below the survey line. Um, you'll also find that the peak or the polymer clasping unit is also a little bit shorter as well comparison to the cobalt chromium framework. But when you compare the actual retention value between these two, they're very, very um, similar and it gives you the retention that the patient requires at the end. So think about, don't just follow the way the traditionally being taught and been designed and manipulate or use the material that's been given to you to allow for the same result for your patient at the end. Another material that is available within the PEC family is the AKP. So AKP has been around for a little while now, and they've also been used in the manufacturing of the partial dental framework. They're very similar to PEAK, but only slightly different in terms of the molecular composition and their higher ductility and the greater elasticity. So once again, think about where you should be engaging and how much contact you should have on the abutment teeth to be able to create the retention at the end. Um, the rest of the properties are very similar to the um, pig material. They're fully biocompatible, they're lightweight, they also have the heat resistant, so you can autoclave these um, beforehand. Um, while they have slightly lower retentive force, and that's to do with um, the ductility and the elasticity, the diminishment of the clasping unit is actually less compared to the cobalt chromium framework. And you'll notice that it will provide the long-term stability and the retention that is acceptable to your patients. 
So here is a workflow as to what would happen if you do use a pig material, the polymer material, where you have a, a puck or a disc uh, where the framework has been milled out. Uh, you simply remove it out of the disc by using a hand piece and do some tidying up of the framework. If you compare this workflow to the cobalt chromium framework, uh, whether you're doing it in a traditional casting way or the SLM way, you'll notice a huge difference in terms of the time spent in order to create this smooth finish um, of the framework um, before the trying happens. Once this is completed, then the teeth have been set up and this can be done in a conventional way or the digital way that I've shown you in the couple of slides before and obviously deliver it um, to the patient. And you'll notice how, how, how much shorter the clasping unit is on this, on the um, abutment tooth. And if you do use any of the clasping unit on the anterior section, maybe the shade um, is a lot kinder in terms of the aesthetic demand for your patient. Um, if the mutual casting is going to be very um, unesthetic for your patient when they're smiling and speaking. Uh, and finally, the last um, component of the PEC family is the PEKK. -K. I think if I keep saying PEC, they probably sound very, very similar and very confusing. Um, PEKK -K is also available as well. Um, they're commonly used for um, implant work as well as more fixed work. Um, although they have the stability as well in terms of the long-term clinical success i think if you do look through your literature there's a lot more mention of the peak material because it has shown that it does give you that clinical outcome that you require um, but peak also it obviously is available if you um is exploring different types of material um, that you could use in terms of the polymer. So how do they um, succeed in terms of the clinical outcome? Uh, one of the areas that you could also look at is a biological outcome at the end. So we've shown you that um, the retention value, the chemical or the uh, mechanical risk stability is is great for your pig material but is this actually going to work for our patient so there has been a study where they have used the pig material in the edentulous or the partially dentate patient where they have a bilateral saddle uh, and they looked at whether this is going to cause any harm in terms of the residual res resorption so in comparison to a control group where they didn't have any treatment provided, uh, what they found was that the vertical height difference as well as the 3D change of the rich area actually did not differ um, significantly when the patient was wearing the denture for almost a year. So it gives you some assurance that um, the way the peak material is functioning in terms of the base material for your partial denture, it's not causing any detrimental effect in terms of the um, biological outcome on the edentulous area and hopefully on the abutment teeth at the end. So I look forward to seeing more long-term outcome in terms of how this will actually function. Um, hopefully the patient will be very um, comfortable of wearing this type of material as well as the aesthetic outcome, but obviously how it's going to impact on the um, long-term outcome of the biology for our patients. So I've shown you some of the um, digital way of using the or oh, fabricating the framework as well as going through the partial denture workflow. Um, I did mention at the beginning that the intraoral scanning may not be so accurate, but hopefully with the improvement of the software as the hardware, I'm sure the, that gap will close in no time. Studies have also shown that when you do use just the digital way of providing your patient with um, partial denture, they are showing some success that based on just the intraoral scanning and the digital design and the casting of the 3D printed resin patterns, the fit was um, very close to the conventional RPD. And there are more and more studies now becoming available to show that 
Um, the framework fit is definitely um, comparable when you are comparing it back to the conventional impressions. And I think that's to do with um, how much we are learning about the way you manipulate the intraoral scanner as well as the data that you are collecting so that there is less and less errors at the end to provide the most accurate STL file for the dental technician to be able to provide the um, the partial dental framework that will work for our patient. So in summary, um, technology is definitely improving in terms of accuracy when providing patients with removable dentures via digital workflow. Um, there are definitely different materials that is now available to fabricate the framework. Um, that's to do with different types of the CAD and the CAD CAM um, technology that is available. But I think the key thing is that the, we all understand the limitation and the differences in the mechanical properties and to make sure that you design the framework accordingly so that you don't blame the material just by um, following the conventional or the traditional way of doing the design, but actually embrace it and um, think of a different way to improve the material's um, limitation. Um, there's unfortunately still not consensus or whether you could use digital workflow from the beginning to the end. So that includes the intraoral scanning. But I think in no time that gap will definitely close and it's only a matter of time before the next improvement is, in, is introduced. I think next year, I'm sure there'll be another intraoral scanner that gives you a, another level up or the way you're scanning could be different, different types of um, software that could also benefit the accuracy of the intraoral scanning for our partially dentate patients. So with that, um, thank you very much for your time this morning. Well, it's morning in New Zealand and I think it will be evening back in Paris. So thank you, Mahmoud, for the time. For your um, exciting um, lecture, um, you dive with us uh, deep for the uh, digital technologies that use it for the uh, removable partial dentures. Um, I know that with the removable partial dentures, there are a lot of challenges uh, facing the uh, clinicians as well as the technicians to provide uh, a functioning uh, prosthesis. But uh, it was very interesting that you uh, mentioned about the uh, technological factors that affecting the, uh, uh, the, the, the workflow. Then you move to the uh, biological or patients related factors that can uh, may impact the, uh, the outcome of the treatments. And um, then you uh, move it to the different uh, uh, impression techniques and uh, 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 impression scanning technologies that are available uh, um, in the market and the way that you are uh, uh, scanning for this successful uh, uh, digital uh, impression. And you uh, go deeper to the uh, materials that use it to fabricate the frameworks and the processes um, and then so, Thank you so much for uh, this very informative uh, lecture that you introduced us for the advance of technologies in this uh, field. So um, let us see. Um, I think we do have some uh, some questions. So uh, uh, once again, I would like to thank all the participants for their uh, attendees today and for the active uh, participation to to to. Uh, uh, ask some questions because it's uh, uh, a great chance to have uh, Dr. Mahmoud ask. She has expertise in this field. Uh, so please don't shy and ask. This is a chance for you to ask. So uh, I think we can start uh, with the first one uh, from the Zao. Intraoral confirmations of parallelism of three unit fixed bridge after preparation. Uh, you uh... um, uh, okay so although i actually talked about partial dental workflow today uh, i suppose that that is also very similar because i think the parallelism of the proximal area also needs to be um, confirmed 
So I think the audience attendee is asking how to confirm during the intraoral scanning. Yeah, parallelism for the uh, 3D unit fixed spreadsheet. I think he or she uh, specifically uh, goes to the three unit fixed bridge uh, after preparation. So I think you're trying uh, to you, parallelism. You'll, yeah. uh, you'll see that um, a lot of the um, scanning unit these days, they'll have, um, uh, what would you call it? the preparation software where you have a look and see whether there's any undercuts, et cetera. So that could be another way to, um, give you some assurance that there is no divergence between the um, one apartment to another apartment. Uh, if you take this, if I take this back to the partially dentate or partial dental workflow, there has been other technical um, report where um, what the clinician would do is that they will scan the intraoral um, area first as your baseline, and then that gets um, exported um, into the CAD software where they will now design a little jig. It's almost like combining what you already know in a way of doing the conventional workflow. So you'll make a little jig that will show you exactly how you need to um, prepare your proximal area for your guidelines, and that gets printed, and that jig is now big being fitted back onto the patient's apartment tea. So that gives you an additional assurance while you're doing the preparation. Uh, but intraoral confirmation, if you're trying to confirm it by using an intraoral scanner, I think the only way really to do it is you pick the path of insertion on the scanner itself and then use the preparation software to give you uh, some idea whether there's any undercut or divergence. Um, so we have... Um... Um, another one. Hi, Dr. Um, Sonkia. Are there any studies about the fracture strength between PEC material conventional denture acrylic materials? Uh, thinking along the lines for full upper dentures, whether PEC could be used to strengthen full dentures? Um, I think the polymer material, they've been used quite often in terms of, say, um, implant work when you're doing uh, edentulous area. So you're doing a full um, fixed bridge, and that has shown some success in terms of the strength. Um, if you are trying to use this instead of using um, conventional acrylic resin for your base material, I think that's definitely another um, avenue that you can look at. Uh, whether they have compared um, the outcome between the PEG material and the conventional acrylic material in terms of providing complete dentures. Um, I personally haven't seen one. If there is one, um, please share. But at this point, when I did my research and going through the literature, um, a lot of the material that they were using for edentulous was for the implant work to be able to provide that um, superstructure for your implant bridge. Yeah. Um, so another one, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Song Yang, for your lecture on such an early uh, lecture. <laughs> um, hello. I was worried I'm <laughs> oversleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, I would like to ask you, do you have difficulties in scanning of edential patients? Um, I think... Well, I did a study um, on scanning of the edentulous mouth, um, and that was to use slightly older version of the software. Um, but when I did move on to the most of the latest software, I did find that the scanning was a lot easier. So if you're comparing same prime scan, for example, to uh, Omnicam with the older software, I definitely found a huge improvement of picking up details as you go through the ridge and the palatal area, because one of the difficulty previously was to pick up the palatal um, details. And I found that with the technology improving so much, um, picking up that particular ridge or the hard tissue area wasn't so difficult. I think the difficulty really is to pick up that movable tissue to find out where am I going to finish my uh, prosthesis so it's not going to impinge on the patient's function. And because of the movable tissue not being so um, 
predictable and really depends on how you manipulate the lips and the um, cheek muscles. Um, I think that's going to be the most difficult area for the intraoral scanning. Hence why you'll see a lot of the hybrid method that's being used instead of just a fully digital um, workflow. They, they might do um, impression instead. We're using a conventional method, but the rest of the workflow becomes a digital instead because they are still worried and um worried that you're not going to get a predictable outcome in terms of the flange or the sulcus area. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, thank you very much for your amazing and useful lecture. How about the 3D printing in uh, removal partial dentures uh, construction? Where do we stand and where is the future from your point of view? So there is um, SLM method, obviously, that is like a 3D printing um, in a way for your partial denture if you are using um, cobalt chromium framework. Um, there is going to be some study with 3D printing of the framework. I can't divulge too much because at the beginning stage, um, but I'm pretty sure there'll be different types of the resin material that you could use in order to be able to provide um, 3D printed um, framework in-house so that you don't have to um, have a resin casting or the cast resin being printed first and then have that moved on to the um, conventional cobalt chromium framework um, or the milled um, framework, but I'm sure there'll be a lot more um, development going through trying to figure out is there a different type of um, resin material that you could use as a definitive um, 3D printer framework. Yeah. Hi, Song Young. Uh, what's the cost difference in PEG material and conventional acrylic? Thank you for such good lecture. Um, I think if you look at just the material, I, there would be a small difference, but I think the key thing is the, um, the manual labor that's involved. It's not so much the actual material that you buy, um, but it's the time spent by the dental technician to be able to um, create that prosthesis for you. And, co and considering the peg or the peg material that you're using, what you're doing is you're designing on the software, you're nesting it into the software, and then that gets milled out in between. The machine is doing all the work. It's not so much the human labor that's um, being occurred. And when the framework does come, when the framework does come out of the machine, the finish is a lot easier um, in order to provide the patient with a very smooth finish. The conventional acrylic, um, as you know, there's going to be a lot more labor in intensive. You have to get your um, wax pattern done or you have to block out the undercuts, et cetera, have that process. So there is a time spent. So I think the benefit of using CAD CAM is not so much the material cost, but the human labor that's involved in between. The time, time is money. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Song Kyung, amazing content. And we have another question. How can tech show relation uh, to partial uh, patient? Is as conventional or digital? Uh, I think that depends on the type of the partial dentate patient that you're dealing with. So some patient, if you are dealing with, say, candy class three patient and they have very predictable um or closer contact, then obviously you could keep going with the digital um, or closer registration. So you take a bite record or the, the buckle bite scan um, to be able to create the maxillary and the mandibular jaw relationship. Some patient may have um, unpredictable or not so stable um, or closer relationship, and you will need some kind of intermediate device in between to have the stability intact while you're doing the digital scan. So you'll find it in some technical reports, they use like an occlusion rim for one side while you're doing the buckle scan on the other side so that it's creating the stability on the left-hand side while the right-hand side being scanned and vice versa. So there's this slight hybrid work going on. Um, if you have a patient that is that does not have a very predictable draw relationship without having to wear something while you are doing the buckle by scan. Yeah. 
So um, I think we finish it with the uh, all questions on this. Um, yeah. Uh, so I have one more question. Um, okay. I know <laughs> you get a lot of questions, but uh, uh, how far we are to the fully digital workflow for the uh, removable partial dentures? I think we're almost there. Okay. Definitely. Because a lot of the study, even though I did put a slight negative spin to the intraoral scanning at the beginning of the um, presentation, you'll see that because of the speed of the improvement that's happening with the intraoral scanner in terms of the hardware as well as the software, I think we definitely almost there because um, you're not just relying on the soft tissue to be able to pick up the details. You have the mixture between the tooth as well as the soft tissue. Um, I think if we overcome the, um, the errors that may happen during the intraoral scanning, the rest of the workflow, I think it's already been... Um, confirmed in terms of the accuracy. So it's yeah. the very beginning part, I think, that we still need to work on. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think taking the advantages of mixture um, structure that the um, teeth and the soft tissue, it's more advanced than the complete denture uh, mm. because for the digital dentures, it's still uh, the, the, the soft tissue is an issue and the impression technique itself is issue where there's the and mucostatic or the functional um, impression. So uh, I guess for the uh, removable partial dentures, it's still uh, more advanced compared to uh, digital uh, dentures. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your time. I know it's very, very early in, in New Zealand this time, um, uh, but uh, we thank you uh, for your time and everything. So, uh, as a tradition for digital Olympics, uh, we would like to present you with the a certificate of appreciation. We hereby express our sincere appreciation uh, to Dr. Song Yang Ma in recognition of her contribution as a live webinar speaker for digital Olympics uh, webinar series, the topic of digital dentistry and removable prosthodontics that was presented on Thursday, April 27, 2023. So, uh, Dr. Ma, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and everything. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And once again, um, I would like to thank all the participants for their time and getting the value of uh, uh, Dr. Ma's lecture. Um, she really uh, gave a very informative uh, lecture for us. Uh, once again, uh, if you need um, a certificate for the CPD, uh, please email us and we will uh, provide you with the certificates for those who attended at least 75% of the live uh, webinar. And also, uh, uh, we will have many other uh, digital dentistry related webinars in the uh, few weeks so please stay tuned and join us for the next uh, webinars have a nice day nice evening and take care bye bye all bye bye